This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Good morning and thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell. Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going to be talking about the DASH diet. Um, That is one of the most popular um, dietary patterns out there. And I think it's a little bit misunderstood sometimes as to what it is and what it means. Um, It is kind of always ties for the top one to two Um, spot for healthiest dietary patterns uh, when we rank diets overall by the U.S. News and World Report. So we're going to spend some time talking about that today, what it is and how you can implement that. Um, If you have a question or a comment for us, our number is 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. And you can always email us fit at mpbonline.org. Um, and actually, we, have, we already have a caller on the line. So, oh, no, we don't. And I dropped the phone. So that's a great, uh, great start to my Monday. So we will uh, keep forging on. So dietary approaches to stop hypertension is what DASH stands for. And the way uh, that I like to think about it, when I say the word DASH, that sounds like a sprinkle of something, like you're dashing salt on it. And so the DASH diet is kind of based on lowering some sodium and lowering some salt in your diet. And uh, but that's not that's not all it is, and that's not the only medical condition that we can use uh, DASH for. So again, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, and it is certainly not a new uh, dietary pattern. And if you're a regular listener to the show, you know in general I like I dislike the word diet um, because that. Uh, usually indicates something that we go on and off of or that tends to be very restrictive. Um, So you will see this referred to as the DASH diet, um, although I prefer thinking of it as a a DASH eating plan or just the DASH nutritional plan. Um, It has been around since like the the 1990s is when the research really started to kick up around, um, around the DASH diet. And before we get into that and what DASH really is and what the basis of it is, I believe Bob is ready for us. Um, So we'll go to Hattiesburg and say, good morning, Bob. How can we help you? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? All right. Thank you. I've asked this question to numerous people, and and they always scan over what they're saying. Okay. And Uh, never really explain what I'm asking. Okay. I'll do my best. All right. Uh, R S V like a uh, lower uh, respiratory uh, respiratory virus. syncytial virus. Yes. <coughs> All right. Say the middle word again. Syncytial. How do you spell that? S Y N C T I A L. All right. That's that's what I'm wanting to know. Yes. When they say this, they, mm-hmm. they just scan over this syncytial. It, please explain what that means. So that so all right so RSV is a viral pathogen. So you know there's hundreds and different kinds types of viruses um, that are out there, and this particular virus, while anyone can get it, right, um, it is more common in children. And when we talk about where this um, virus likes to attack or the part of the body that it likes to attack it's the the little bitty um breathing tubes so when we think about um breathing in through our nose right the air goes down through our trachea and then into one of two big tubes called the bronchi and then each one of those things bifurcate or split into little smaller airways think of it like coming off the interstate and there's lots of different little side roads around in there and so when we talk about um, RSV it kind of attacks those small vessels and we call it bronchiolitis um, which is 
inflammation of the bronchioles. Um, and so we see that the kind of the lining of some of those bronchioles kind of start to slough off or get gooey. Um, and that's often uh, some of the respiratory sounds that we hear um, in uh, this type of, of infection. We call it sounding junky because it sounds like all of, of those um, uh, skin, well, not skin cells, but epithelial cells that are lining those airways have um, kind of sloughed off and are starting to kind of clog up some of those. And this becomes more of a problem in those little kiddos because their airways are just naturally smaller. And so we'll see them have more uh, more respiratory difficulty um, with that. You'll see them start to breathe faster. Um, and you'll also see um, them have dehydration from that. Um, it, when we talk about the actual word syncytial, it's just talking about kind of at the cellular level, the, the, the structure where kind of cells meet in those different types of things. Um, but in essence, this type of respiratory pathogen attacks those little vessels and causes them to kind of get or those little airways and causes them to get kind of congested, makes it hard for them to breathe. And the little ones will kind of stop eating and drinking because they can't um, breathe as well when they're eating and drinking. And so they prioritize breathing over the eating and drinking which is an important part. So that's often why they get admitted to the hospital, not just for respiratory support, but to also um, support them from a a fluid and a nutrition standpoint. Hey. Yep. This essential law, is that describing uh, the actual problem or? No, it's describing more on the cellular level, kind of where um, where the cells are meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's just a... Conjunctual were the uh, one of those. That's that, right. One of those fancy big medical words we put in the middle of things to make it sound confusing. Okay. Well, I didn't know if it was describing the, the virus. No. Or not. No. So it's just it's the uh, actual uh, condition taking place. Yes. All right. Thank oh, you. You're so welcome. Thank you for giving us a call today. That was a great one. All right, guys, we'll head back over to talking about um, the DASH diet today. And if you're just joining us, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And I mentioned that it's been around for a while with the beginning of the kind of research and the evidence uh, around this dietary pattern really starting uh, in the early 1990s um, and funded by something that's called the National Heart Lung and Blood Institute. We often in healthcare abbreviate that with NHLBI, and it's one of the National Institutes of Health, and they were looking at um, trying to evaluate whether certain dietary patterns could treat hypertension, right? And hypertension, again, is one of those bigger medical words we like to use, but it just means high blood pressure, right? Um, And high blood pressure refers to the pressure inside of our blood vessels or inside of those roadways around our body. And so looking at could diet or dietary strategies help treat hypertension was the basis for this particular research. And even in the kind of first beginning studies that were done on this, they found that diet alone, so not diet and exercise or diet and meds or anything else, but just this dietary pattern alone could reduce the systolic blood pressure by 6 to 11 points, okay? So let's unpack that for just a second. Systolic blood pressure is the number on top. So when you go to your doctor's office and they uh, check your blood pressure, they usually give it to you in something over something, right? Like 140 over 90. That top number is the systolic number, and it is the pressure inside your blood vessels when the heart is squeezing, Okay. The bottom number is the diastolic number, and it is the number, uh, the pressure inside those vessels when the heart is taking its its break, right? So the pump, rest, pump, rest, pump, rest. And so they're equally important in terms of overall cardiovascular health. Um, but when this dietary approach kind of first started being developed, uh, we were really focused on this, that systolic number. And so a normal uh, systolic number is 120 or below. Right. And so for folks that are um, kind of borderline hypertensive or that are not getting great control of their blood pressure from other methods, 
a reduction by 11 points is wonderful. It can move you down into not having high blood pressure anymore. And what was really interesting about um, this research is that this worked in people that had high blood pressure and people that are what we call normotensive. So in people that would not meet diagnostic criteria for having high blood pressure, it helped improve their blood pressure um, even in the normal range. So the DASH diet can be a really powerful strategy, um, and it's actually considered first-line treatment. And when we say the word first-line treatment, it means it's the first thing we should be telling people about when we have high blood pressure. We should be talking to them about dietary strategies that can help lower their blood pressure. That doesn't mean we don't also do medication. It's all going to depend on how high your blood pressure is when we're starting and what other risk factors you have. But having a discussion about dietary strategies to assist in lowering that blood pressure should be happening. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about today is what those dietary strategies are. We'll go ahead and take our first break of the show. When we come back, we'll have that discussion here on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell nurse practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're talking about the DASH diet. And the DASH diet stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, But I hope as we go throughout uh, the rest of the show that you'll learn that DASH is not just for people with high blood pressure or people trying to prevent high blood pressure, that it is a dietary pattern that can be applied to multiple um, different ways of eating, even if you have no chronic medical conditions and you're just looking to stay healthy. Uh, So we talked about kind of the basis and how long it's been around for, but I want to kind of compare and contrast a little bit between um, what we call the standard American diet or a westernized diet and what the kind of foundation of the DASH eating plan is. So standard American diet, often abbreviated SAD, which is sad. Um, and sometimes some of the foods may make you a little sad, but we'll talk about what they are. So the standard American diet is usually high in saturated fat um, and higher Um, kind of glycemic load carbohydrates. So more processed carbohydrates or simple carbohydrates like um, bread, which bread is not bad, right? Um, But uh, refined flours, cakes, cookies, pies, um, refrigerated doughs, those types of things. And none of these things are bad, right? Um, If you know, if you listen to me at all, I hope that you realize that I'm talking about balance when we're talking about um, really any lifestyle strategy and that we want to balance our budget, um, our access, and our health goals when we're building um, a nutrition plan. And so there are places in uh, your way of eating for any of these foods that we talk about. Um, So don't, you know, don't think I'm telling you you can't have any of these things or you shouldn't have any of these things. But the standard American diet is heavy in these things and also heavy in something called omega-6 fatty acids. And oftentimes, Um, You'll hear the word omega fatty acids and you think, oh, those are healthy. We're supposed to be eating those. Well, what we're really talking about uh, for the heart healthy fats are omega-3 
fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids are a little um, on the less healthy for a scale. Um, We talked um, about inflammation a lot on this show, and omega-6 fatty acids are more um, inflammatory and just cause a little bit more underlying inflammation, whereas um, omega-3s are a little bit more anti-inflammatory. So again, it's not about only omega-3s or no omega-6s. It's about the ratio of those things. And so making sure that the uh, majority of our fats fall more in the heart healthy category and less in the inflammatory category. So if that's kind of the standard way of eating um, that we have in a westernized diet, what is DASH, right? What is the DASH diet and where are the foundations of that? Well, the foundations are fruit and veggies, okay? um, grains, whole grains, not refined grains, lean meats and dairies, and an increase in micronutrients. And so we did a micronutrient show um, probably about six weeks ago. So if you uh, want to learn more about micronutrients, you can look for that by um, by going to our podcast, wherever whatever platform you get your podcasts on and searching for Southern Remedy. That show should be in there. But we're talking about things like um, – potassium and calcium and magnesium and those types of things. So the DASH diet tends to have more micronutrients on board and less sodium, right? And so sodium is a nutrient of concern when we're thinking about high blood pressure and trying to help uh, reduce fluid volume load in people who may be fluid volume overloaded, those types of things. Um, and at the at the very basic basic um, way to think about DASH is it is more minimally processed food and fresh. And fresh for um, for purposes of discussing about health foods uh, can be actual like fresh fruits and vegetables, but it can also be frozen fruits and vegetables because they often have uh, just as much nutrition as the others. So when we're building out a, a DASH plan, Um, One of the things that you'll see is it recommends certain serving numbers in each one of these areas. And that's where I find where people get confused. Um, Serving size is um, a concept that while not difficult, when you're trying to put it into practice can be a little bit of a challenge when you're first starting. So there is a difference between serving size and portion size. Okay, Serving size is what um, is often on the back of a package and tells you this is how much of something uh, contains the other uh, nutrient information on that label, right? So if you flip over a package of bread, right, and it says there are 110 calories in this piece of bread, we need to look at the serving size to see how much bread they're talking about, right? Um, whether they're talking about one piece of bread or two pieces of bread, and that may vary depending on uh, brand. But that matters, right? If we're trying to balance our plate, if it's 110 calories per slice, that's a whole different kind of calculation than if it's 110 calories for two slices, right? Because if you eat two slices, which most of us do if we're making a sandwich, then we got to double those calories and all the other nutrients that are on that label, right? So serving size is often dictated on a package. Portion size is what actually ends up on our plate and then ends up in our belly, right? And those two things may not always match, Right. Like if you flipped over the serving size for potato chips, first of all, it usually tells you a ridiculous something like one ounce. And you're like, I don't know what an ounce of potato chips is. And then some brands will give you like in parentheses, they'll tell you how many chips that is. And it's usually something absolutely um, sad, like seven or sometimes 11. Um, But that's not very many chips. Right. And so that's often not the portion that we then eat. And so whatever the back of that bag was telling us about, we'd have to multiply that times however many servings we had. And so when we talk about serving size in terms of the DASH diet, these are our servings that I hope will also translate into portions, right? But let's talk about what it means. So for fruits and vegetables, and a lot of people are going to go, oh my gosh, this is a lot of fruits and vegetables, but just, just stick with me, okay? So for fruit... It's four to five servings per day, okay? Not fruits and vegetables together, but fruit, four to five per day. Vegetables, four to five per day, 
Okay? Again, that sounds like a lot when we think about it in terms of what in our head we think of as a portion of something. But I'm going to talk to you about what that means in terms of actual serving size in just a minute. Grains, six to eight servings a day. Low-fat dairy, two to three servings a day. Lean meats, poultry, fish, six ounces or less per day. And they actually break it into six one-ounce servings per day. Okay? Six ounces or less per day. Nuts, seeds, and legumes five times a week. Okay, And so you may be thinking, well, you always talk about a plant-based diet, right? You just mentioned the word meat. The DASH diet is still a plant-based diet, right? Plant-based doesn't mean no meat. It just means plant predominant. And when you look at the servings that I just mentioned in each one of those things that we consider plants, right, fruits, veggies, grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, this is still a plant-based or plant predominant way of eating. If you're thinking of it in terms of looking at your plate, that's three quarters of your plate as plant food and a quarter as either a lean meat or a nut, seed, something like that. Okay. So what are these kind of magical serving sizes. When we say, uh, you know, six to eight servings of grain, what does that mean? Well, it depends on what kind of grain we're talking about, right? But if we go back to thinking about our bread situation, usually a serving of bread or serving of grain, and we're choosing bread, is one slice, right? So when you're thinking about six to eight servings of grain, if you're having a sandwich, that's two servings of grain at that particular meal right there. Okay? Um, an ounce of dry cereal uh, or a half a cup of cooked cereal, rice or pasta, right? And so an ounce of cereal is not very much, usually somewhere depending on the cereal and you know what all it has in it, somewhere between a third um, of a cup. Most of us eat a whole lot more than a third of a cup of cereal, right? So if you're having a, a bigger bowl of cereal, that's multiple servings of grain at that particular uh, meal. Same deal goes if we're doing oatmeal, right? Um, a half a cup cooked is the serving size. A lot of times people start with a half a cup of dry oatmeal and fix their oatmeal and then it becomes a cup of oatmeal. And that may be fine if you're not, um, you know, uh, regulating blood sugar or any of those different kinds of things, that cup of oatmeal may, may be fine, but that is two servings of grain right there. So again, thinking about serving size versus portion size. All right. What about those fruits and vegetables? Because four to five of each one of those sounds like a lot. And people are like, I am just going to be eating celery all day long. But that is not the case. So for veggies, what is a serving? One cup of raw leafy green veggies is a serving. Right. So think about when you build a salad, it often has more than a cup of leafy green veggies in there. Right. So you may get two servings of veggies right there just in your lettuce or whatever base you put in your salad. What about other veggies? A half a cup cooked or raw of the other ones. So carrots, broccoli, cauliflower, celery, tomatoes, although technically a fruit, but we're going to put it in the veggie category. Onions, peppers, mushrooms, green beans, asparagus, all of those different kinds of things. A half a cup is a serving. So if you have a full cup on your plate, which is a lovely portion of those nice non-starchy veggies, again, you've got two servings going on there. And then juice, um, a veggie juice can actually count as your veggie servings, although I tend uh, to talk about them or push them less just because they're often high in sodium, which is what we're trying not to not to do here in terms of um, our blood pressure control, but it'd be a half a cup of any of those juices there. So in essence, if we boil that down, it's somewhere around two and a half cups of vegetables. So when you think about two and a half cups, for me, that sounds like a much more manageable amount than thinking about five servings of vegetables in there. Okay? Um, it can easily be achieved by having a nice big old salad for lunch or making half your plate those fruits and veggies. So what about fruit? What's a serving size of fruit? Well, if it is a whole fruit like an apple or a pear, something like that, um, you'll see the guidelines say one medium fruit. 
what the heck is a medium fruit, right? Well, it really depends on what other fruits you got available, right? You could have little bitty tiny ones. You have really big apples, all those different kinds of things. I like to use my fist as a good general measurement of that. So you make a fist and look at it, and that's about the size of a medium um, piece of, of round fruit like an apple or an orange or a pear or something like that. Um, what if it is a banana? Okay, Bananas usually, depending on how big they are, and bananas have gotten bigger over time, usually about a half of a banana is a serving. Okay, Doesn't mean you can't eat that whole banana at that same time, but that would count as two fruit servings usually. Any of the other um, fruits that are out there, whether they be fresh, um, frozen, or canned, are going to be a half a cup. Um, for a serving of fruit. Now, if it is a dried fruit, so your raisins or your dried cranberries or your dates or any of those other kinds of things, it goes down to a quarter of a cup, okay? So one medium fruit, half a cup of fresh canned or frozen, and a quarter of a cup of dried I often get asked about juice in this particular area as well. Juice is a very popular um, beverage choice for folks, and it can absolutely fit in to your dietary pattern. Um, juice is um, can be a large blob of calories at one time because you can drink it very fast without filling up your belly a whole lot. So a serving of juice is a half a cup. So if you drink a whole cup of juice, that is two servings of fruit that you've had right there. Um, If you're trying to lose weight or trying to control blood sugar, I would be cautious about how much juice you consume at one time because it just is a lot of calories for a small volume of things. Okay. Um, What about dairy? What is a serving of dairy? Um, Well, it's a cup of milk or yogurt or one to one and a half ounces of cheese. And what is one to one and a half ounces of cheese? Well, if you think, look at your thumb and you go from the kind of first big joint of your thumb out, that is usually the size of an ounce of cheese. Okay? Um, often, um, you can think if you're a domino player, which my grandparents were, about the size of a domino, um, again, is about an ounce to an ounce and a half of cheese. Now, my tip for cheese, if you choose to consume cheese, it is very high in saturated fat, so we do want to be careful there is to choose the more robustly flavored cheeses, okay? So feta or blue cheese or sharp cheddar or Parmesan or something like that that has a lot of flavor in it because then you don't need very much. That ounce to an ounce and a half is enough for you to be able to taste and appreciate the fact that there's cheese in there. When we choose a very mild flavored cheese, like um, an American or a mild cheddar or a mozzarella, we have to add a whole lot more of that cheese to that dish to make it taste like cheese. So if we're trying to, to kind of watch how much cheese we're adding to things, and we should be, um, then that is kind of my, my tip or trick there. All right, let's go ahead and take our next break of the show. When we come back, we're going to talk about um, some of the serving sizes for our proteins here on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, and today we're exploring the role of the 
dash diet in overall health and in particular how it impacts um, blood pressure and cardiovascular health. Before the break, we started going uh, into the difference between what a serving size is and what a portion is, the serving often being what is um, given to us by guidelines or on the back of packages. And portion is what we actually choose to consume, right? And so they may be the same thing. They may not be the same thing. Um, And we kind of went through um, the servings for grains or starches as well as fruits and veggies before the break. Um, we talked also talked a little bit about dairy. Um, had a question that came in that said, what about like a, a like a singles, like a, a you know, a packaged um, cheese slice singles. Um, so I looked that up to see what the what that size was. In my head, I had that probably somewhere around an ounce, and it is almost an ounce. So it was 21 grams and an ounce is 30 grams. So just a little bit below um, below an ounce there. Um, you know, be careful with your cheese slices as well, though. Um, they're usually a lot of added oil in there. Again, doesn't mean don't have them. Just means uh, maybe let's throw some veggies in there with it, too, just to kind of stretch it and give yourself a little bit of fiber there. All right. So what about um, meat um, and lean tw- lean cuts of uh, meat and protein? Um, so for the DASH way of eating, that is usually going to be um, poultry um, and fish are going to be the two that are recommended more, um, not so much on the processed meat uh, area, so not your sandwich meats and your bacon's and that kind of thing. Um, and we've always talked about that on this show that um, while I choose not to eat meat, that doesn't mean you have to choose not to eat meat. But the quality of your proteins do matter. And so, if we're trying to control blood pressure or cholesterol or weight, um, we do want to, to lean toward the ones that are less processed as our main protein sources. And so, for Dash, it was six one ounce portions, right? And one ounce is not a whole lot. And most people aren't going to eat one ounce of meat at a meal. Um, so most people are going to to kind of clump those together and not have six individual servings of meat, but more like two, three ounce servings. And so what's a three ounce serving of meat? Usually a small chicken breast or a filet of fish um, is in the three to four ounce range. Um, often like to think of it for for chicken or pork, it is about the size of a deck of cards. And for um, fish, it's like the size of a checkbook, if you guys are still using checkbooks, right? Some some folks are out there and they're like, I don't know what she's talking about. Um, but uh, a checkbook um, is a good way to think about uh, your fish. Um what about eggs? Eggs also fall into this kind of leaner choice of protein category, and um, a serving of that is one egg. Okay, so think about that if you're having more than one egg, and usually for heart health, I don't recommend having more than one egg um, a day. Um, if you want to kind of stretch your egg, then have one whole egg and some egg whites um, with it, to, so that way you get that good lean protein in there, but you do limit out the saturated fat and some of the cholesterol there. What about nuts, seeds, and legumes? Or what the heck is a legume? I often hear, um, well, technically a peanut falls in the legume category, but that's also where you'll see things like peas, um, in particular things like black-eyed peas. It's also where the majority of your dried beans are going to land. So any of your beans, black beans, pinto beans, kidney beans, that's what we're talking about in this particular area. Um, And that is a half a cup of cooked legumes or dried beans is a serving. Right. Um, what about nuts? A quarter of a cup of nuts is a serving as well. Two tablespoons of nut butter. So if you like your nuts in butter form, um, a serving of that is two tablespoons. And then if you're using seeds, um, which you may think, what you talking about seeds? I'm talking flax seeds, chia seeds, um, pumpkin seeds, uh, sunflower seeds, those types of things. Um, the serving amount is the same. So again, two tablespoons um, would be the appropriate serving there. Now, the reason for a smaller volume on some of those is because they they are a lot of fat and calories, kind of at one at one whop. So that's why there's a little bit of a limitation there um, on the amount of those. And so the kind of these categories that I've talked about up until now, the fruits, veggies, grains, lean proteins, nuts, seeds, legumes, those are the foods we want to encourage, 
right? The ones that we are wanting to add to our diet that that should make the um, foundation of our eating plan. The ones that still have a place in any way of eating, but should be um, monitored a little bit more or, um, you know, consumed a little bit less are the fat slash oils. And we're talking about kind of added fats and oils and then kind of sweets and added sugars. So again, not none, but less. Um, What's a serving of oil? Again, this is um, what is vastly different from what we normally see, right? So a serving of oil is actually a teaspoon, but that is not what the package says, okay? The package usually says a tablespoon as a serving, right? So if we're having a tablespoon of oil maybe in our salad dressing or something like that, that's multiple servings of of oil at that time. Um, What about like mayonnaise? That's also considered a fat because it's largely made from oil. Um, A tablespoon of mayo is a serving. And then the ever popular salad dressings, right? So your ranch, your Italian, your Thousand Island, your French, your Catalina, all of those lovely dressings that we put on things, even your vinaigrettes, um, a serving size of that is two tablespoons. And I see a whole lot more than two tablespoons going on for a lot of folks, and that's okay. Um, But we want to think about some strategies to try and reduce some of those things, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, What about sweets and added sugars? Um, A serving is one tablespoon of sugar. Now, that does not mean I'm telling you to add a tablespoon of sugar to something, okay? That means that, you know, we talked about the sweets and added sugars are things we need to eat less of. And so when we're counting the number of servings that we've had or we're just trying to keep track of added sugars, technically a serving is a tablespoon. That also is the same for jellies and jams, okay? Um, So if you're having a regular jelly or jam, a tablespoon is a serving. Um, Or if you're having like an ice cream or a sorbet or something like that, it's about a half a cup on those, okay? Um, Most people eat more than a half a cup of ice cream, okay? Um, So again, you got to count that as more servings on board there, all right, so that was that was a lot of content, um, and I don't expect for you to remember all of it, but I do want you to at least think about the difference between what a serving is and what a portion is and make some intentional choices if you're trying to improve your heart health and your weight. Um, I want to talk for the next few minutes about something called the Salty Six. Okay? So the Salty Six are six types of food that are, are where a bulk of our salt or sodium intake comes from that we may not always perceive, be perceived as salty, right? Um, and so the vast majority of the salt in the American diet or the sodium in the American diet comes from processed foods, right? Um, but there are kind of six big categories that stick out. The first one is one that people probably don't think about as being salty, but it is breads and rolls, Okay. Um, and again, this goes back to serving and portion, right? If you have one serving of bread or rolls, it may be a low sodium food. But if we have multiples of them, right, which we often do with things like the bread basket that comes to the table at a meal or the rolls that are served with something, um, then the, those all add up and can be very, very high in sodium. Um, in particular, some of the leavening agents, some of the things that make baked goods puff and rise tend to be very salty. Um, The next category is pizza. Pizza is one of those um, really high in contributing towards saturated fat, but is very high in sodium as well. And so the strategy there is not no pizza, right? Um, Pizza, Friday night's pizza at my house, but the toppings matter, right? So we know the pizza dough is going to be salty. And we know the cheese that's on it is going to be salty. So now we need to pay attention to the toppings that we put on it. So maybe not a bunch of processed meats like pepperoni and sausage and those types of things. Um, if we're really wanting meat on it, maybe we choose um, you know, a, a grilled chicken on that pizza or leave that meat off entirely and load up on the veggies on top of there. That way you're able to enjoy that pizza for less sodium than you would have if you'd gotten the meat pizza. Um, Sandwiches are uh, another uh, one of the salty six, and that's for two reasons, right? Usually the breads and then also the luncheon meats that we put on the inside. 
So it doesn't mean no sandwich. It thinks you just got to be thinking about the filling that you stuff in there, right? So maybe instead of lunch and meat, maybe we do hummus and veggies um, in that sandwich instead of turkey and cheese, right? Or maybe we leave the cheese off and just have the turkey. All of those things matter. Uh, Other cured meats um, and cold cuts, that is number four, right? My favorite sandwich filling is a chickpea salad, where you make it kind of like chicken salad, but you use chickpeas instead, Um, and it is a wonderful filling that you can put in there, and that way you're getting some fiber on board as well. Soup is number five on the salty, um, the salty six, and again, that goes back to serving versus portion, um, because oftentimes the little cups of soup that you get at the store, you consume that whole thing at one time, but it was actually two servings worth of soup in there, according to the label on the back so that can be a lot of salt at one time Um, so uh, that might be a good spot to spend a little bit of extra money and look for this lower sodium variety of that soup and then burritos and tacos round out that top um, six for salty things and that can be from the um, you know the stuffing the the meat or whatever's on the inside but it's often from the toppings as well you like pickled jalapenos cheese sour cream all of those different kinds of things can add up and be quite salty there all right we'll take our last break of the show when we come back i'll give you some of my other suggestions for implementing the dash diet in your life here on southern remedy healthy and fit This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Thanks for joining me today here on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. We've been talking about the DASH diet today, and I've kind of given out the, the guidelines for that. Um, And I want to spend the last couple of minutes of the show talking about how we put these things into practice, right? How do we uh, make these an action item that we can do? One of the limitations, um, if you want to say uh, or call it that for DASH, is that it is not as kind of clear cut as some of the commercial diets out there, right? They tell you, like, absolutely don't eat this or only eat this and eat this in this certain amount. And so it can be a little bit... Um, harder uh, when you're first starting to put DASH principles into action. Um, but if we, th- if we maintain the notion of a plate, right, um, and how we build a plate, that is the easiest way to hit the, the, the DASH servings and to start eat more, eating more of a DASH-based way of eating to support heart health. And so thinking about a plate in terms of the right size plate, right? So not a platter, but an appropriately sized plate, which our dinner plates in America have increased in size over the last 30 to 40 years. And so we simply just eat off of bigger plates. And so there can be an argument being made to move toward the smaller uh, middle plate of the dish set. Um, But you don't have to. Right. Especially if you're making three quarters of your plate plant based foods, right? Fruits, veggies, grains and that quarter of the plate, um, you know, know, whatever protein choice you choose there. So get you a plate that you're comfortable eating off of. Not too big, not a little teeny tiny tea saucer. Right. And divide it in half. Right. Um, When you're first learning how to do this, you can get a paper plate and get a marker and draw half across there. That way you kind of get a good visual sense of what's going on. But half of that plate, making it fruit and or vegetables at each meal. So at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner, and you may say, 
vegetables for breakfast. Absolutely, you can. If you don't, that's okay, too. You just have fruit. But if you like scrambled eggs, think about throwing in a half a cup of chopped vegetables into that, right? Now we've got that one, uh, we've got an additional serving of fruit, uh, vegetable on board right there. Or throw, throwing in um, a cup of spinach and letting it wilt down into the scrambled egg, right, or in that omelet. Now you've added those veggies in there, right? But a half of your plate as fruit and or veggie a quarter of the plate as a grain or a starch, and a quarter of the plate as protein, whether that be an animal-based protein, like some of the lean protein choices we talked about here, or whether that is a plant-based protein source like um, the the legumes that we talked about, the nuts, the seeds, or something like tofu or tempeh that are um, soybean-based options there. That's the easiest way to start to implement some of those things in there. One of the other um, kind of complaints I hear or, or push backs I hear is the serving size of things that we enjoy is often smaller than what you would eat, right? Like pasta. So when we think about cooked pasta, a serving size of cooked pasta is usually about a half a cup of cooked pasta. That's not a lot right? Especially when we think about the serving of pasta that we normally consume uh, when we have spaghetti or fettuccine alfredo or any of these other kinds of things. So stretch it, right? Have your half a cup of pasta, but what are some of the things we need to increase in our diet? It's the vegetable, right? So maybe we have um, mushrooms and Um, asparagus tossed in that fettuccine alfredo, right? So they were able to stretch the amount of food that we have on our plate while keeping our servings of grain where they need to be and bumping up our serving of vegetables, which is often what we lack in this country. We are lower on the fruit and veggie train and much higher on the grain train. So we want to think about ways to do that. What about with our proteins and our meats? You know, how do we keep Those to lower, um, you know, more that six ounces or less, stretch it again. So if you're making tacos or spaghetti or something like that, instead of making that with a whole pound of ground meat, make it with a half a pound of ground meat and add some veggies in there. Maybe you add beans or lentils in there to stretch it if you're making tacos. Maybe it's zucchini and squash and... um, Uh, you know, uh, greens that are tossed in there. If you're making a shepherd's pie, something like that. Think about the things we need to eat less servings of and the things that we need to eat more servings of. And instead of having an all or nothing approach to it, how do we marry those two things together so that we still have flavors that we're comfortable with, that we know how to cook, but that we're stretching. And in you know the times that we're in now where a lot of these animal based proteins are significantly increasing in cost being able to reduce the size of that while also having a full belly and a full plate of food is really really important and we can we can do that with things like beans and some of our frozen veggies that we're able to add to our ground meats, um, to our eggs, to these other kinds of things to stretch them um, and be good for your pocketbook and also be good for uh, your waistline. Um, Because DASH is not just used for blood pressure. There's a lot of good evidence and good research out there about how, how it improves blood sugar, how it helps with weight loss, how it helps with bone health and osteoporosis prevention, and tons of other benefits out there. All right, guys, we are out of time for today. If you didn't catch the show, be sure to search for our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. Southern Remedy is a production of MPB Think Radio and is funded in part by a grant from UMMC. It's produced by Kevin Farrell, and the podcast producer is Jermaine Flood. And I've been your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC. Be sure to tune in every weekday at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup.